Hello, and welcome to all of you who are joining us today online. We're glad you're here with us. And a special welcome to all of those who are connected to the Crossing Church family, located in both St. John's and Gander, Newfoundland and Labrador. We're glad you're here. We are in week two of our new message series called Ruth, a story of compassionate loyalty. Now, just a quick overview before we dive in. Scholars are uncertain of who wrote the book. They don't know who the author was, but they believe they may know when it was written. Since there's a genealogy included at the end of the book, it was likely written after the reign of King David. Therefore, the events within the book likely happened about 100 years before his birth. Now, Ruth is a skillfully written story, highlighting so many themes, one of which is the Hebrew theological concept called hesed. Hesed can't be defined by just one word we learned last week, but rather one author says it wraps up many concepts. Love, mercy, grace, kindness, goodness, benevolence, loyalty, and covenant faithfulness. Of course, these are all attributes of God. Ultimately, the story points to God's invisible hand at work behind the scenes, using tragic events that ultimately bring triumphant, uh, triumphant outcomes as he works out his purpose and plans for his people. The end of Ruth chapter 1 gave us a summary of the events that happened to that point, that Naomi returned to Bethlehem with Ruth the Moabite, just as the barley harvest was beginning. This is a providential timing since the reason Naomi, her husband, and sons left Bethlehem was because of a famine. So there were no crops to harvest. But now Bethlehem, whose name means house of bread, was about to be restocked. So in chapter 2, the author is setting the stage for the audience that there is now going to be a change in the scene and a change in those who are participating in characters. It's creating this sense of anticipation for the audience about what is going to happen next. So we're going to pray first, and then I'm going to get you to open up your Bibles, if you have them with you, to Ruth chapter 2, and we're going to do the entire chapter, verses 1 through 23 today. But as always, let's pray before we read God's word. Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for scripture that reveals your living word, word, Jesus. And we pray now that you give us open eyes and ears and hearts to receive what you have for us today from this wonderful story in Ruth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, Ruth chapter 2, let's begin. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So suddenly the plot thickens and the audience is randomly led in on an interesting twist. There was a man named Boaz who was a relative of Naomi's dead husband of all things. The readers would rightly anticipate that perhaps Naomi's bitter fortunes, her misfortunes, were about to change. And as a close relative of Lemelech, as we noted in chapter 1, he would be Naomi's kinsman, Redeemer. This, of course, was the closest single male relative of a widow without children. He would marry her so as to continue the dead man's line. The audience would have known this Israelite family law custom. And it says that Boaz was a man of standing. Scholars say that this meant he was a man of substance. He was a man of wealth. He wasn't just an ordinary guy. Let's continue. And Ruth and the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now, as I highlighted in chapter 1, Ruth is referred to as Ruth the Moabite, or Moabitess, five times in this story. Highlighting her ethnicity as a foreigner and as an outsider was purposeful for this author. There may have been racial tension as Ruth was single in a patriarchal culture. 
Her need for protection was highlighted later in the chapter and confirms this. Ruth, it seems, took no time to recover from her journey and declared her desire to go right out in the fields and start working, to start gleaning. Fields didn't have fences or visible boundaries and they were divided into large tracts of land. Several of these could be owned by one person, but she hoped to be able to glean or pick up the stalks or the ears of the grain that had, dropped, had been dropped by the harvesters. And this was a provision of the law that would allow those who were poor or widowed to pick up what was left behind. So her statement about picking up grain behind anyone whose eyes she, in whose eyes she finds favor suggests she would ask permission from someone in authority before she began. She was a vulnerable foreigner who would humbly not assume she was entitled even though the law would allow for it. Naomi told her to go. Now notice Naomi doesn't offer to go with her, uh, maybe because of her age, but others have suggested that she was still recovering from her state of bitterness and despair at her empty situation. It's hard to say. But nonetheless, she referred to Ruth affectionately by calling her my daughter. And that phrase, as it turned out, in other translations says, it so happened. And the paraphrase says, as luck would have it. Early on, the author is letting the readers in on the invisible hand of God. He was guiding Ruth's steps to the right place to be gleaning, as one author said, in the jumbled patchwork of subdivided property, she just happened to find the piece of far farmland belonging to Boaz. God, the true hero of this story, revealed his divine hand at work. Let's go on with verse 4. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Once again, there's another it just so happens moment. When Boaz just so happened to arrive at the field while Ruth was still there, you want to talk about timing. Boaz greeted his workers with a blessing. He must have created such a positive work environment with his workers. And it didn't take long for him to notice Ruth, who, some scholars say, may have had a distinct look being a foreigner. But others think that Boaz would know this. This was not a worker that he had hired. So he asked the supervisors who she belonged to, and this statement assumed that this stranger must belong to someone. Another scholar says it may have meant whose daughter or wife is she, or to which clan does she belong? The foreman explained she belonged to Naomi, and she had asked permission to gather the bundles that the harvesters had missed, and some say she was waiting for permission, but the supervisor didn't feel he had the authority to give it to her, so she'd been waiting all day. But alternatively, others believe he did give her permission to glean, and she'd been working from morning until then, taking only a short rest. Verse 8. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along with the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. 
have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Wow. Here we see the development of Boaz's character and his relationship with Ruth. Notice how he referred to Ruth as my daughter. This was the same way that Naomi referred to her. This not only acknowledged the significant age difference between them, but it signaled that although Ruth was a foreigner, he would offer her protection and provision like a loving father would. He told her to stick with the female servants and glean where his people were harvesting. She wouldn't have to worry about being harassed by male workers because he warned them not to take advantage or mistreat her. And I love what one commentator says, Boaz is hereby instituting the first anti-sexual harassment policy in the workplace recorded in the Bible. Yay, Boaz. She was allowed to drink freely of the water that was drawn by the men, which is culturally significant, as usually foreigners would be the ones drawing the water for the Israelites. And then women would be the ones drawing the water for men. But here, Ruth is allowed to drink water drawn by the men. And what's Ruth's response to Boaz's wonderful um, Hesed kind of care, kindness? She fell down on her face in submission and gratitude that he would even take notice of her, a foreigner. Boaz's acknowledgement of her gave her dignity as well as the same social standing as his Israelite workers, and she couldn't believe it. Boaz had heard all about what she had done for Naomi, and he was so impressed, leaving her home, coming to a strange land among people she didn't know, all because of her loyal love or her hesed for Naomi. This seemed a reasonable uh, explanation for his favor for her and showed the audience that Boaz was a good man. He was a man to standing. Now he prays a blessing upon Ruth. He says he prayed that the Lord Yahweh would repay her for what she'd done for Naomi and that she would find refuge under his wings. Boaz had given Ruth comfort and relief, and she thanked him for his kind words to her. She couldn't believe that her race and her class hadn't affected Boaz's compassion toward her. And in verse 14, Boaz continued his kindness to Ruth by inviting her to eat with him. Remember, in the ancient Near Eastern times, eating was more than just satisfying hunger. It was in the context of offering hospitality and friendship and fellowship. Notice that Boaz ate with his harvesters, which again said much about his character. But when he invited Ruth, the outsider, the foreigner, to join him, everyone must have been surprised. He invited her to take her piece of bread and dip it into the sauce that was there. No dry bread for Ruth. He gave her food enough to satisfy her and then some. And one scholar says, Boaz took an ordinary occasion, an ordinary meal, and transformed it into a glorious demonstration of compassion, generosity, and acceptance. The biblical understanding, of course, of chesed. Let's go on. Verse 15. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And don't rebuke her. Ruth's gleaning has just gotten easier with Boaz's instructions to the workers to pull out stocks and to leave them for her to pick up. And they weren't to insult her or shame her because of her alien status. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. And then she threshed the barley and sh that she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He's not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, 
He even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So Ruth gleaned about 13 kilograms of barley, and that's not bad for a day's work, and imagine having to carry that home. But in this final exchange of the chapter, Ruth and Naomi talked about her day. She told Naomi that she worked in Boaz's field and how compassionate and kind he was to her and how generously he had treated her. Naomi's tone begins to change toward God and her circumstances. She once was angry and bitter, but hearing about the day's events and her interactions with Boaz, she declared that God had not stopped showing them, both the living and the dead, his hesed or his kindness toward them. Ruth just happening upon Boaz's field is for Naomi a sign of God's invisible hand at work and his grace and his favor toward her. She revealed to Ruth that Boaz was indeed a close relative of her dead husband and she knew that he was one of their guardian or kinsman redeemers. There may be hope for the family to see the line of Elimelech continued, but how? So things were looking up for Naomi, and likely Ruth had no idea about this provision in the Israelite law. Naomi told her it was good for Ruth to stay close to Boaz's women who were working in the field. She would then be protected from harm. The chapter ends with verse 23 giving a summary of the outcome of the events of chapter 2, excuse me, the end of chapter 2. Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz's field until the harvest ended, and then she sent, settled into life living with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Boaz had provided for these women with food. He would provided, we could say, economically for them. But there was a more urgent need. With no male members of their family left to carry on a Lemelech's name, there was much more at stake. And one scholar notes the significance of this. They say, in Israel, there was no greater tragedy than for a family to cease to exist. I invite you to tune in next week to see what happens next. You know, God always blesses the reading of his word. So what are we to glean from this chapter of this amazing story? So much. But again, Boaz's hesed or kindness towards Ruth, a foreigner, and God's hesed kindness shown to Naomi and Ruth, this is a strong theme running throughout the entire book of Ruth and especially throughout this chapter. There is one idea, however, that I'd like us to consider from this part of the story. I'd like us to consider how we view what may seem like random coincidences in our lives. Do we see them as just luck? Or do we understand that as followers of Jesus, God's hand is involved in the movements and the events of our lives? Think about it. Throughout this chapter, there are so many it-just-so-happened moments. It just so happened that Naomi and Ruth arrive back in Bethlehem during the spring harvest so that Ruth can collect food for them. It just so happened that she found herself, where else but in Boaz's field. Of all the fields she could have been in, she was in his. And it just so happened that this man was a close relative of Elimelech during the time when the provision of kinsman redeemer, the kinsman redeemer law was in effect. And it just so happened that Boaz arrived at the field while Ruth was there, and he noticed her, and he protects and provides for her, a foreign widow at the bottom of the ladder when it came to social status. And even at the beginning of the story, when there was a famine in Bethlehem, and Naomi, her husband, and sons leave to live in Moab for a time, and the men marry Moabite women. One, of course, being Ruth. It just so happened. Today, I just want to do a little retrospective on our own lives and consider that what we might think are coincidences are so much more, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. When we reduce the events, the circumstances, and the twists and the turns of our lives to coincidence, or as luck would have it, 
moments, we're denying the reality of God being actively at work in our lives through the ordinary and everyday things, through our daily interactions and meetings with others, through the tough circumstances, and even through the great ones working out his purposes and his plans for us. I've been thinking a lot this week about the just-so-happens events that have taken place in my life and the life of our family. I just want to share a quick story with you, if I may. We moved here to St. John's in 2015 following God's call on our family and for me to be the senior pastor of this wonderful church. My husband, who is an IT guy, he left his job trusting that God would provide another job here in his field. One year passed no job. Two years passed, no job. And we were wondering what we were going to do if something didn't happen soon. Well, it just so happened that one of our church members was a friend of a part owner of a company, and he offered to share my husband's resume with him. Weeks passed, and but then finally a call for an interview. Things were hopeful. However, this wasn't a job in the computer technology field that my husband has been part of for years. It was an entry-level position. Now, we were grateful that God had provided. My husband showed such humility and character and obedience in that he would do whatever it took to provide for his family. And so he did so with a grateful heart. But a few weeks in, it just so happened that he was leaving his shift and walking across the parking lot of the company. It, was, it just so happened that um, one of the owners, the one who had been given his resume by the church member months ago, drove in at the same time. He rolled down his window and he asked him how he was doing. And, and Dave thanked him for his job. He was so grateful. And then the owner asked, hey, aren't you an IT guy? It's as if Dave's resume almost flashed through his mind as he was talking. And Dave said, yes. And the man said, I need an IT guy. I'll call you the first of the week and we'll set up a meeting. Well, the rest is history. This just so happened moment led him to being a business analyst in this company, creating efficiencies, all due to the knowledge he had from starting out in the entry level position. And we see now that it was God's invisible hand at work through it all. So let me ask you, what are the just so happens moments in your life? Do you see them just as mere coincidences? Do you believe that God is at work through every circumstance of your life? Are the twists and the turns in your life just random? Or is it God's invisible hand guiding you as you make choices and as he works in and through them? Scripture knows nothing of coincidences or luck. Proverbs 16.9 says this, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. One author and pastor noted, All things, all events are directed by the providential hand of God as he works out his good purposes in history. This includes the free actions of human beings. God never coerces human wills as if we were robots. The Bible teaches both that humans act freely and that God directs every event in our lives, the big and the small. That's pretty awesome. Such a mystery. So how would our perspective about what has happened in our lives or what is happening in our lives now, how would it change if we actually believed this? And I know some who just shrug off or dismiss coincidences as just random events, but if you're a follower of Jesus, this absolutely isn't true, and it diminishes the reality of the divine activity of God and that he has a purpose and a plan for you, that everything that happens to you is all woven together as part of his plan. So when we experience those moments, how do we explain them? Do we just dismiss them and say, well, that was just luck? Or do we say, God, what are you up to? What are you doing? And wait with expectation and assurance that he is at work in and through everything, especially even in times of trial. When we trust that God is at work in all the events of our lives, it helps us not to worry about the future. It allows us to face uncertainty with confidence, knowing that he's at work behind the scenes, working everything together so that his plan for you will be fulfilled. 
And the story of Ruth is an important example of God's invisible hand working throughout history, through her ancestry, to bring Jesus, our Savior, into the world. The very heart behind the invisible hand of God is love. All we experience, even the difficult circumstances, are filtered through his hand of love. And how do we know this? Well, we need only to look at the cross of Jesus. Romans 8, 31 and 32 says this, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God loves you. He is for you. And he is working out his plan and purpose for you as he uses our circumstances to transform us, becoming more and more like Jesus. And that's no coincidence. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this story of Ruth. We thank you uh, that you do guide and direct our paths. We thank you that you're at work in and through every circumstance that we encounter, every event in our life, every ordinary, everyday um, uh, event or interaction. You're at work. Lord, give us eyes to see this. Help us not to be skept skeptical or diminish um, your divine activity in our lives. Help us to be um, trusting you in those times of uncertainty when we find ourselves not understanding what's going on or, or why. But Lord, let us trust that even in and through those trials, you are working out your purpose and plan um, for us. So we thank you that you are active, actively involved in our lives. And Lord, help us to just acknowledge that throughout the day and that when we're faced with especially um, difficult circumstances, that we will just be asking you, Lord, what are you up to? Because we know that you're up to something. There is no random coincidences in the life of a Christ follower. We thank you that you are guiding and directing us. We thank you for your work of transforming our lives into becoming more and more like Jesus. It is a mystery, but we know it's real, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.